All right, everybody, welcome to Math with Grace. Today we're going to be going through Algebra 2, Book 2, Lessons 11 through 15. Lesson 11 begins on page 39, and it's titled Quadratic Equations. It tells us here that the term quadratic means squared. And here is the standard form of a quadratic equation. AX squared plus BX plus C, where A, B, and C are real numbers, and A is not equal to zero, but B and C could be equal to zero. The quadratic term is this X squared term, or whatever variable is squared. When we are solving a quadratic equation, such as X squared equals 16, or X squared equals seven, we see here that two, undo a square, the opposite of squaring something is to take the square root. So when we take the square root of x squared, we get x. We take the square root of 16, it becomes this plus or minus, plus or minus the square root of 16, or plus or minus 4, because remember from last week, 4 squared is 16, and negative 4 times negative 4, right? Negative 4, the quantity squared, is also 16. So here's where we need that plus and minus. Last week they talked about it, but we didn't really use it. But here, when we're solving quadratic equations, we will be using it. As for this x squared equals 7, we're going to do the same process. We're taking the square root of both sides, because we need this x to be by itself. And the opposite of squaring something is taking the square root. But with the 7, right, doesn't have a perfect root, so it just ends up being plus or minus the square root of 7. Now, continuing down the page here, as we look at example 2, it says solve this equation. The quantity x minus 2 squared equals 3. Now, we have to think of the quantity part inside the parentheses as just a variable would be treated and we want to take the square root. So we square root both sides. In this part, they forgot their plus and minus, right? So it'd be here, plus or minus. But when we take the square root of a quantity squared, the quantity part is all that's left behind, right? So we have x minus two equals plus or minus the square root of three. And then we solve for x. 2 is being subtracted, we're going to do the opposite and add to 2 to both sides. Now, we cannot combine the 2 and the plus or minus square root of 3, so it just sits right like this. This is an appropriate answer. Now, some people like to split it into its two parts, right? It would be 2 plus the square root of 3, and it would be 2 minus the square root of 3, but you don't have to. This plus and minus represents that perfectly fine. If you'd like to, you can, but if you want to leave it like this, you can do that as well. It says down here at the bottom of the page, if a quadratic does not have a perfect root, try to factor the equation and set each factor equal to zero to find the value of x. Let's turn the page. So what did they mean when they put the instructions on the bottom of the last page in the ex examples here? Well, let's take a look. We have x squared plus x minus 20. Obviously, this is not going to be a perfect root, so we need to factor like we've been working on. So they factored it into x minus 4 times the quantity x plus 5. And that's how they get their plus 1x here and their negative 20 there. What you do then is you take each set of parentheses or each term and you set that term equal to 0. So x minus 4 equals 0 and x plus 5 equals 0 and then you solve for x. So we find out that x equals 4 and x equals negative 5. There are our two answers. Because when we solve quadratic equations, they don't make it very clear, but when we solve a, a quadratic equation with a squared term, that means we have two answers. An x squared tells me I have two answers always. There will always be two answers. That's where that plus and minus comes in, right? And for the last example, it was 2 plus or minus the square root of 3. That was our two answers. 2 plus the square root of 3, 2 minus the square root of 3. Let's look at example 4. Example 4 says solve the equation 6x squared plus 5x minus 4 equals 0. Now, boom, they factored it, right? But looking at this problem, 
there would be a lot of uh, experimenting, right, to figure out. I, I wouldn't even look at this problem and be like, oh, I know exactly how to factor that. It would take quite a bit of experimenting to figure out that these were the factors. And maybe you're just not that great at that. Maybe you wouldn't even come to that conclusion. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to teach you a trick to solving, factoring quadratic equations where the x squared term, the quadratic term, has a numerical coefficient other than one, right? Once it becomes not a one, it becomes more challenging. So here's the trick to that, right? I'm just going to do it right here on the side of the paper. So I'm going to rewrite it so I have what I'm working with, x squared plus 5x minus 4 equals 0. So here's step one to this trick. You're going to take the quadratic term and then the constant and multiply them together. So 6 times negative 4 equals a negative 24, right? Now we're going to think what factors of negative 24 are going to add together to give me a 5? Well, here's some of the factors, right? 2 and 12, nothing there is going to get me to a 5. Um, 3 and 8 would be next. And if I have a negative 3 and a positive 8 together, that would give me a positive 5x, right? So that's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to write that. We're going to pair the, the 3 with the 6 and the 8 with the 4 because they have factors in common. So we're going to rewrite this equation like this. 6x squared minus 3x plus 8x minus 4 equals 0. Now, we haven't changed this equation at all. If we combined our like terms, we would be right back where we started. What we've done is we've just split our x apart into terms that we can then group together with the other ones and then factor and start our factoring process, okay? So I'm grouping these two terms together. What do they have in common that we can factor out? Well, they have a 3 and an x in common. What is left behind? Well, we're leaving a 2x here and we're leaving a negative 1 there, right? There's just a 1 left. And then we have this side. What factor do 8x and negative 4 have in common? They have a 4 in common. When we pull that 4 out, we're left with a 2x minus 1. Equals 0. Don't forget your equals 0. Now, each of these terms has a section in common, right? This 2x minus 1. I'm going to factor out that 2x minus 1. And what is left behind? Well, it's this 3x plus 4. Oh, I forgot my x. Plus 4. And now you've factored it. You're at the same part that they are, right? I mean, they just booped right to it. But here is kind of a trick so that you're not like, okay, 6 has to be multiplied a 2 times a 3. But then what combinations of 4 are we going to use? Is it going to be a 2 times 2? Is it a 4 times, you know, it, there's a lot of... Um, trial and error that would take quite a bit of time, possibly, to figure out that these were the correct um, factors. But in this case, we just worked it through. So I'm going to just review the steps one more time. When we have a coefficient that is not a 1, we can use this. We're going to multiply the first coefficient and the last constant by each other and then get a number. Then we're going to figure out what factors of that number give us our linear term, which is the term with the x, right? Once we have that figured out, we're just rewriting that, okay, in the middle with our x's. So we had 3x, 8x, negative 3x plus 8x. Then we can group them with the other terms, and we're going to factor something out of each of those, and we should end up with them being multiplied by the same quantity, right? So here it was 2x minus 1, 2x minus 1. Once we're at that stage, we factor that like quantity out, and what's left over is the other set of factors, okay? I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to go through that again coming into our problems down here, actually. I know we will. Um, so we'll take a look at that in a minute. But let's take a look at this last example, example number 5.
Oh, well, I guess maybe we should finish example four, huh? So <laughs> once we've got it factored, we set each factor, each term equal to zero, just like we did before. And then we solve for x. So in this case, x equals one half. And in this case, x equals a negative four thirds. And so those are our two answers to that quadratic equation, okay? Now looking at example five, it says this example has no constant. However, it can still be factored. We have 2x squared minus 5x equals zero. Well, these two terms have something in common, which is an x. And so they factored that x out, which left 2x minus five. We set each term equal to zero. So x equals zero, because it's just what's sitting out there, right? And the quantity 2x minus 5 equals 0. We solve both, and we get our two answers for that one. Okay? All right. Let's do some of these problems together. I'm going to grab some scratch paper. Okay, so we are in Algebra 2, Book 2, Lesson 11, page 40. Problem number 1. x squared equals 10. Remember, we want our x to be by itself. The opposite of squaring something is to take the square root. So we're going to take the square root of both sides, and we end up with x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 10. Now, can the square root of 10 be simplified? What are its factors? Well, it's 2 times 5, right? Both of those are prime factors, so we cannot reduce it any, any at all. I guess any farther, I was going to say, but we didn't reduce it at all. So <clears throat> it cannot be reduced. So our answer is x equals plus or minus 10. That's what gives us our two answers. Looking at number two, we have the quantity x minus 2 squared equals 4. Well, again, we want to undo that square root, so or the square. So to do that, we need to take the square root of both sides. When we take the square root of this, all that comes out is the x minus 2. It's going to be equal to plus or minus the square root of 4, which is 2. All right, so now we have x minus 2 equals plus or minus 2. So this one is a little bit different than the examples that they set up, but we're going to work through it. We need to add 2 to both sides. So x is equal to, and now I'm going to actually write it in two ways, okay? x is equal to positive 2 plus 2 and x is equal to negative 2 plus 2. Okay, I need to take both parts of this, and in this case, I'm splitting it up. So here I have x is equal to 4, and on this side, I have x is equal to 0. And those are my two answers then. Sometimes we'll be able to combine these two numbers when they come together, sometimes we won't. But in this case, we could not only combine them, but we could reduce it all the way, okay? All right, number three, x squared minus 5x equals negative 14, or sorry, minus 14 equals zero. We want to factor this, all right? So what factors of 14 are gonna add together to give me a negative five? So negative 14, negative five, I'm pretty sure it's two and seven, right? But I want my seven to be negative and my two to be positive. So my x gets separated, minus 2, oh, minus 7, plus 2, plus 2, minus 7, right? That will give me my negative 5, and I can check it. x times negative 7 is negative 7x. 2 times x is 2x. That gives me my negative 5x. Now I need to set each one of these equal to 0. So x plus 2 equals 0, and x minus 7 equals 0, and then solve. So I get here that x is equal to negative 2. And on this side, I get that x is equal to 7. Boom. Okay, there's our two answers. For number 4, we have 2x squared minus plus x minus 3 equals 0. I'm fumbling all over myself today here. We need to factor this. Now, my coefficient of x is greater than 1. You could use the method I showed you. Um, but this one's pretty simple because the 2 is a prime and 3 is a prime. So let's try and work this out um, together here. This is going to be a 2x and this is going to be an x. It's the only way for us to break this up, okay? This is a negative 
here, but we have a positive answer here. So that tells me that whichever one of these is positive, I'm gonna have one negative and one positive, that this number is the largest one. But my factors of three are only a one and a three, right? So I need to know, how am I gonna get this to be a positive number? And where does my negative sign go? Well, if I take 2x times, if I had written a three in here, I'll write it in real light. Let's make this a three and a one. 2x times three, that's going to give me 6x, right? But one times x, even if it's a negative one, that's my combined answer is going to be 5x. So I know that that is not going to work out. That's too much x. So let's switch it. What if I put a three here and a one here? Now, two x times one is two x, three times x is three x. If I make this a negative, then two x times negative one gives me my negative two x. Positive three times x gives me a positive three x, and that will leave me with this single x term. So that is how my factors need to be laid out. So two x plus three equals zero x minus one equals zero. We're going to subtract three from both sides. So two x equals negative three. And so x is equal to negative three halves. Here we just subtract or add one to both sides. So x is equal to one. And there's those two answers. All right, let's look at the next two problems. All right, number five. 2x squared plus 2x equals zero. So we don't have a constant here, but we can factor out something from these two numbers, right? They, these two terms have a factor in common, and that factor is 2x. Oh my gosh, why did I write that parentheses? 2x, okay? So what is left behind? Well, here left behind is an x, and then this other term, what would be left behind is a one. So now I need to set each term equal to zero. So two X equals zero and X plus one equals zero, okay? If two X equals zero, then X must equal zero. And here we subtract one from both sides and get that X is equal to negative one. All right, so we need to make sure we're factoring when we can factor. Number six, now number six is set up in a way that we're gonna use the trick that I talked about during the examples. We have eight X squared plus 10 X minus three. Yes, we have a three over here, so it's primes, but there's too many factors of eight, right? Eight and one, two and four. I guess there's not too many, but there's, there's some. <laughs> so I don't wanna deal with it. I'm just gonna go ahead and use the trick that I showed you in the example. So what that is, is eight times negative three gives me a negative 24. So what factors of 24 are going to, or negative 24 come together to give me a 10. Um, so the factors of 24, we're gonna start with two and 12. And here, if I have a negative two and a positive 12, then I will end up with a positive 10, right? I'm gonna, um, put the term together. I'm going to put the 2 with the 8 and the 12 with the 3. So it comes to 8x squared minus 2x plus 12x minus 3 equals 0. That's what it's going to look like. If I combine my like terms, I'm back where I started. So I know that I have the, the terms correct. I know I have the factors correct. Now I'm going to group them together. What factor do 8x squared and 2x have in common? Well, they have that 2x in common. So I'm going to pull that out, and I'm left with 4x minus 1. Now over here, 12x minus 3, what do they have in common? It's only the 3, but I'm going to pull that 3 out, and it leaves me with 4x minus 1. Now that these they have this 4x minus 1 in common, I'm going to take that out. So 4x minus 1, and what's left behind? This 2x plus 3. Oh, don't forget your equals 0. Okay, so now we factored it um, 
to its factorable points, and so we set each one of these equal to zero. So 4x minus 1 equals zero. 2x plus 3 equals zero. Adding a 1 to both sides, I get that 4x is equal to 1, so x must be equal to 1 fourth. Subtracting 3 from both sides, I get that 2x is equal to negative 3, or that x is equal to negative 3 halves. All right, and so those are my two answers. Um, this is just a trick that makes factoring just a little bit easier, especially when we have these coefficients of our quadratic term being so large or just not being one or, you know, a very simple two up here, okay? So factor when you can factor. Sometimes we have to take the square root and that's enough, but remember when we take the square root like that, we've got the plus or minus of whatever is on the right-hand side of the equal sign, okay? And then we set each factor equal to zero when we factor them and we solve. All right, good job. That's lesson 11. Go ahead and finish the rest and I will meet you back here for lesson 12. Lesson 12 begins on page 43 and it's titled Imaginary Numbers. And it tells us here that no real number multiplied by itself an even number of times will give us a negative answer. So the imaginary unit i is a number whose square is negative 1. So they've kind of got to this point where you can't find the square root of a negative, so they just made up a way to be able to do that, okay? And that is this imaginary unit i. i squared is equal to negative 1. And i then is equal to the square root of negative 1. So looking at this example here, the square root of 8, we break it apart and it's going to be equal to the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 8. Negative 1 is equal to i, right? So we replace this square root of negative 1 with an i. So now we have i times the square root of 8. And then because 8 is the factor of 4 and 2, we take the square root of 4 out, which gives us this 2i times the square root of 2 that's left behind. And so that then is simplified all the way. So to simplify radicals with negative radicands, use i to change the sign of the radicand and then extract the roots. And here is a pattern that is formed with our i's. So i to the 1 power, as we said here, is equal to the square root of negative 1 which is equal to i. i squared is basically the square root of 1, negative 1, times the square root of negative 1, or negative 1. i to the third power is, again, this double square roots of negative 1, which gave us negative 1, times the square root of negative 1, which is i, so we get negative i. And then i to the fourth power is two groups of these negative ones, and so it becomes one. And then after that, the pattern repeats, okay? So it's i, negative one, negative i, one, i, negative i, or negative one, negative i, one, so on and so forth. The pattern just repeats if you get to higher levels of i to the somethings, okay? Now, whenever imaginary numbers are multiplied, the product will often have power of i greater than 1. To simplify the product, place the power of i with its equivalent according to the pattern shown previously, okay? So we have i 3i squared times 12i. Now, you could reduce this 3i squared first um, before you multiply, or multiply and then reduce it doesn't really make a difference, but they multiplied first to get 36i to the third power. Now, as per this chart here, i to the third power is equal to negative i. So they've taken out the i to the third power, replaced it with that negative i, they substituted it in, and so the answer was negative 36i. Okay, that's, that is simplifying it to the, the furthest extent that we can. Okay, so looking at example one down here, we have the square root of negative 75. Well, 
First, we wanna break apart and take away that negative number, okay? So it becomes the square root of negative one times the square root of 75. We know that negative one is equal to i, so now it's i times the square root of 75. 75 is 25 times three, right? 25 being a perfect root, we can pull the five out, so we get five i times the square root of three. Okay, let's turn the page. For example, one here continued, they just have a bunch of um, examples. I've kind of highlighted them so that they're not hidden amongst each other. We have nine i times three i. Well, coefficient times coefficient gives us 27. i times i was i squared. So 27 times i squared is 27 i squared, right? Well, i squared though is a negative one. So we substitute that in and our answer then is simply negative 27. Looking at the next one, we have two i times negative i times four i. So coefficient, coefficient, coefficient gives us negative eight. And then we have i to the third power. So negative eight i to the third power Looking at that chart or going back now, in the, the old books for Algebra 2, the chart was like this, which was a nice little thing you could photocopy and keep with you. But we're looking at i to the third power, which is a negative i. So 8 times negative i, I'm sorry, negative 8 times negative i gives me a positive 8i. All right? Now, the next example, notice that the negative radicands are first changed to positive by extracting the i. Now, in this problem, it's a little messed up. Um, it should not be negative six to the 100th power, okay? It's just the square root of negative six times the square root of negative two. Now, in each of these cases, we're going to pull the negative out first. So we have the square root of negative one times the square root of negative six times the square root of negative one times the square root of two, right? The square root of negative one is i. We have two of them, so it becomes i squared. i squared times the square root of 12. Now, remember, the factors of 12 are four and three, or one set of factors, but four is a perfect square. So we can pull that out, and here's our two, right? This i squared becomes a negative one, and our three is still stuck underneath the radical sign. So we have negative two times the square root of three, okay? Sliding over to the top of page 45, we have the square root of negative four, the quantity cubed, times the square root of negative 25, okay? The square root of something cubed is a kind of complicated situation, right? But we need to think about it as one step at a time. So the first thing they've done is they pulled the negative out, just like we did in the last examples. So we have the square root of negative one times the square root of negative four, the quantity cubed. And they did the same thing here, square root of negative one times the square root of 25, okay? Now, the square root of negative one is i, so that becomes i times the square root of four, the quantity cubed. The square root of negative one here is i, so it becomes times i times the square root of 25, okay? Now, here's where we need to cube it now. And when we cube it, we're cubing the i and the square root of four, okay? So it becomes i to the third power, and this, again, this uh, radical sign goes way too far. i to the third power, okay, times the square root of i to the 64. And you maybe you're thinking, how did we get there? Well, it's the square root of four times four times four, okay? Four times four is 16, 16 times four is 64. And then we have i times the square root of five still. I don't know why they haven't pulled that five out, but we'll get to it when we get to it, right? So we have all together i to the fourth times 
the square root of 64 is 8, the square root of 25 is 5, so i to the 4th times 40, I've never seen it written in that order, usually you would write 40i to the 4th, right? And then what is i to the 4th? Well, again, I'm just going to pull out the other chart because it's a little easier than flipping pages back and forth. i to the 4th power is 1, okay? So 1 times 40 is 40. So there's a lot of simplifying that we need to do. We need to just take it one step at a time and work our way through it. So let's do these problems together. All right, so we're in Algebra 2, Book 2, Lesson 12, page 45. Problem number one is the square root of negative 18. So our first step is we're going to pull out the square root of negative 1 separate from the square root of the 18. We've broken off the negative 1, made it separate. Now... The square root of negative 1 is i. So this becomes an i. And what about our negative 18? Well, it has two factors, right? Well, it has more than two, but 9 and 2 are factors of 18. 9 is a perfect root, so we can pull out that 3 and leave behind the 2. So we end up with 3i times the square root of 2. For number 2, we have 2i times 4i times 3. So coefficient times coefficient times coefficient gives us 2 times 4, which is 8, times 3, which is 24. i times i is i squared. Now, again, using our chart, i squared is negative 1. So now we have 24 times negative 1 or negative 24. Okay? For number 3, 8 times 3i is 24i, and that's all we can do, okay? It's just the i by itself. But number four, we have the quantity negative 2xi to the third power. So we need to cube each part. So negative 2 cubed and i cubed. So negative 2 cubed is negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, which gives us negative 8. i to the third power is negative i, so we end up with a positive i, or 8i, sorry, positive 8i. Okay, and these imaginary number ones are kind of weird, but we just need to, like I said, one step at a time. Now, for number 5, we have negative times the quantity 4i to the 4th power. So now this negative is not included in our power, okay? So we end up with this negative times 4 to the 4th power times i to the 4th power. Now, what is 4 to the 4th power? Well, it is 256, okay? i to the 4th power, looking at our little chart here, is a 1. So our answer is negative 256. Okay? All right, let's look at the next set. Okay, for number 6, we have the quantity 3i squared times negative i. So we want to take 3 squared, which is 9, times i squared, right? That's this first part, and then times a negative i, okay? So now I have negative 9 i to the third power. And what is i to the third power? Well, it's negative i. So negative 9 times negative i gives me a positive 9i. The imaginary numbers are kind of weird, but this is just what we're doing, okay? So Number seven, the quantity negative one, the square root of negative one to the sixth power. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and change this square root of negative right now to an i to the sixth power. And then this chart goes that far, right? It goes to the sixth power and then I actually labeled like the continuation of the pattern, but i to the sixth power is negative one. So this is just negative one, okay? What about over here we have Number eight, square root of i times the square root of i times the square root of the square root of negative one times the square root of negative one times the square root of negative one, which is just 
i times i times i, right? Or i to the third power. And i to the third power is negative i. And so that's our answer for that one. Looking at number nine, we have the square root of negative three times the square root of negative five to the third power. Now, I feel like they wanted this problem to be like this, but actually let me check the answer key and see how they want this to be set up. Okay, so they do not want the parentheses in there, all right. Sometimes you gotta check, you're never sure. It's, uh, there's been a lot of errors, so better safe than sorry. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do for each one is we're gonna separate that negative square root out. So negative square, or square root of negative one times the square root of three times the square root of negative one times the square root of five to the third power. And I'm gonna leave it, I mean, it, it, you could write 125, but I'm gonna leave it as the square root of three for now, and I'll show you why in a minute. So over here, I'm gonna change my square root of one to a, or square root of negative one, sorry, to an i. So I have i times the square root of three times, and I'm gonna change this to an i as well. Now, the square root of five to the third power is basically five squared times five, right? Five squared is a perfect root. Okay, because remember the opposite of squaring something is taking the square root. So I can pull that five out and that leaves this square root of five left behind. Okay, so that's kind of why I left it. You could make it 125, but then you'd have to break it back down to 25 times five. And so rather than multiply it out just to factor it again, we just leave the factors like that. So now I have this set up and I have five i squared times the square root of three times five. Because remember, when we multiply radicals, we're just gonna put them underneath the same radical sign when they have the same index, okay? Now, what is i squared equal to? i squared is equal to negative one. So I have five times negative one times the square root of 15, or negative five times the square root of 15. Now, the 15 does not have any more roots that we can pull out, so that is as far as we can factor. Okay, so when you're working through these imaginary numbers, remember we just want to keep working. It should be simplified down to either an i or a negative one or a positive one or a negative i, okay? But we should never in our answer have i to the power of something. It should always be reduced, okay? I will do my best here. I'm gonna to try to make a copy of this little cheat box here. It's definitely helpful. Um, so you don't have to keep flipping back and forth. And I don't expect you to memorize, of course, the answers here. So you keep that with you. All right, great job. Go ahead and finish the rest of lesson 12 and I'll meet you back here for lesson 13. Lesson 13 begins on page 47, and it's titled Linear Programming. Now it says here that linear programming allows programmers to determine the best way to achieve their goals by using linear inequalities to describe several aspects of a situation. Now, we just spent last week time graphing um, multiple linear inequalities, right? Systems of linear inequalities, and that's what we're doing here but it's kind of taking on a story problem aspect. And so here are the parts of a linear programming. It says an objective function representing the aspect of the problem to be minimized or maximized, okay? The set of inequalities representing the limits or constraints of the problem. The solution, basically you graph these constraints and the part where they overlap, right? The, sh the darkest shaded part is the solution. And just like a system of inequalities, you know, it, it takes up a region. It's, it's an area that works. So example one, these are kind of long examples. I am going to be reading quite a bit so that we are kind of going through it together. So Mark Cedar Shop makes cedar chests in two sizes. Each large chest requires six hours of construction labor. The small chests require two hours of construction labor. 
it says to build, but it's construction labor, okay? So we have a six hours of construction labor and two hours of construction labor. Both chests require two hours of finishing labor. These are the important parts of this story problem. It says the shop can dedicate no, no more than 100 construction hours and no more than 40 finishing hours to each week to make these chests. And so they want to know if the shop sells the large chest for $220 and the small one for $140, how many of each should they make to maximize their profits? How many small chests, how many large chests should they make of each to get the most profit? And this, of course, is assuming they sell eat all of it in one week, right? But that's just an imaginary kind of setup. But what is their best makeup? Is it 10 small chests and four large chests or what? What are what are the numbers here? They want to maximize their work, which makes sense, right? They're running a business. They want to get the most out of their money. So step one here is to find the objective function. Well, the objective function is their profits from the number of large chests they make. So $220 times the number of large chests plus $140 times the number of small chests that they make, okay, would equal their profits. That's the objective function. Step two, and they're getting their steps here from, remember the steps of the program, the parts, is to determine the constraints. Now, the shop can only do 100 hours of construction. The large chests, however many they make, that's the X, take six hours each. The small chests, however many they make, that's the Y, take two hours each. And that has to be less than or equal to 100. It cannot go over. They only have 100 hours, okay? That's one of the constraints right here. The other constraint is the finishing labor, right? And each one, no matter how many chests of one or the other that they make, take two hours. So it's two hours times the number of large plus two hours times the number of small has to be less than or equal to 40 hours. Okay, that's the next constraint. And then the shop cannot make negative numbers of chests. So understood constraints are that the number of chests, number of large chests has to be greater than zero or equal to zero. And the number of small chests has to be greater than or equal to zero. So we have four constraints here that we're going into this problem with. All right, let's turn the page. Top of page 48, our example one continues. So here are our four constraints. And they graph them and see how they've pointed out each line that they've graphed except for these two because they are the axes, right? And the darkest shaded part is this part here, okay? The feasible region is what that's called. The part where they all overlap, okay? Now, we graph each one. The points that satisfy the constraints are the feasible region. Finding the feasible region is the same as finding the solution for a system of equations, okay? So now that the feasible region is identified, step four, the X and Y values that give the largest profit must be found. The maximum or minimum values of any linear program will be found at a vertex of the feasible region. So what does that mean? At a point. And they call that principle the corner point principle. Okay, so it's saying at this point or this point, this point or even this point, which that doesn't seem like it's feasible, right? I mean, that's definitely not going to be your maximum profits making none of each. So it's going to be this point, this point, or this point. Those are our corner point principles, right? Our corner points for either our maximum or minimum values. Continuing down here, now they've kind of zoomed in here to that. I mean, it's just the same graph, but they've zoomed in, okay? And so what they want you to know is that sometimes the vertices are found just by looking at the graph. Sometimes they're easily seen, although this one here in the middle of the stuff, probably not so easy. And so if they're not easily found, then we have to use substitution with our equations and solve for the intersections. So in the case of this one here, I'm trying to fit it all into one shot, but... In the case of this one here, 
our intersecting lines is the 6x plus 2y is less than or equal to 100, and 2x plus 2y is less than or equal to 40. So those would be the two lines we would have to solve either by substitution, elimination, however you want to do it. But we would need to solve them to find the place where they intersect, which is this point here. They've labeled it 15 comma 5. This point here, which is our 6x plus 2y is less than or equal to 100, we should be able to solve for by substituting 0, right? This is the x axis that it's crossing. So if we substitute 0 for y, that point should come up. And they found it to be 16.67 comma 0. And the same for this one. But this is the 2x plus 2y is less than or equal to 40 line. But if you substitute a 0 for x, then you should be able to solve for y. And here they got 20 comma 0 is the point. Okay. And then, of course, 0, 0 um, is there. Now, to actually solve our problem, to find the maximum profit possible for this problem, you enter the xy coordinate into the objective function, was, which was that first um, equation that we solved for, right? Profit equals 220 times the number of large plus 140 times the number of small. So we substitute in each set of coordinate points. And that's what they did over here at the top of page 49. Yes, this is taking up a lot of space, right? These problems are going to be a little bit involved and they're going to take up space. So the first one that they put in was zero, zero. Okay. It's safe to say zero dollars is not the most profitable choice. Then they put in zero large chests and 20 small chests and came up with a profit of $2,800. For them, the next point was 15, five. So 15 large chests, five small chests, the profit there was $400 or $4,000. And then they put in 16 and they put a star because the answer was what? 16.67. You can't make six sevenths. No, you can't make 67 one hundredths of a chest. And so it's just 16 comma zero. But then they did round, round it up, which I find hilarious, um, but it really should be a 16. Uh, 16 times 220, um, the number of large chests, or zero small chests gave them $3,740. So the largest profit here would be that if they, yeah, see, so then they say it's not possible to make a fraction of a chest, so they change it to 16, but then they multiplied by 17. So this really should be a 16, okay? Um, and I'm not sure. Let me see if that works out then. 220. I mean, I know it's not going to be as much as 4,000, but then this should be $3,520. Okay. Sorry, we just had to, <laughs> had to check the math here. So for Mark to optimize his profits, he should be making 15 large chests and five small chests per week. And again, that's assuming, you know, that he sells them all, but that's that's not a question that they're asking today, <laughs> right? So a lot of processes, a lot of steps. We're going to go through these examples. This video is going to be longer because of that, because these examples are pretty long. But the reason I want to go through all of the examples with you is, well, example three is broken, but they only give you two problems then to do in the lesson. So I want to make sure we go through all the examples so that... Um, you understand what's happening because they don't really give you that many to actually do on your own. All right, so let's take a look here at example two. All right, so it tells us here that Paul is a crop farmer who has 200 acres available for planting corn and soybeans. He needs to plant at least 30 acres of corn and at least 20 acres, but no more than 80 acres of soybeans. So at least 30 acres of corn at least 20, but no more than 80 acres of beans. How much of each crop should he plant to maximize his profit if he gets $495 per acre of corn and $200, $280 per acre of soybeans? Okay, so <clears throat> problem number one, they've 
given these um, variables, which is not what really they did in the last step, but that's okay. Um, I probably would have used a C and a S for my variables, but whatever, you know, X and Y works just as well. I guess it helps us keep the proper coordinates, right? So what is your objective function? Now, the profit received from selling the produce, right, is just like they had it li listed on the last one, profit equals $495 times the number of acres of corn. And this should be $280 because that's what it says here, right? $280 times the number of acres of soybeans. So now what are our constraints for this problem? Well, he needs to plant at least 30 acres of corn. So corn needs to be greater than or equal to 30. He needs to plant at least 20 acres of beans. So our beans have to be greater than or equal to 20, but we can't plant more than 80. So it has to be less than or equal to 80 as well. Okay. And he cannot have more than 200 acres of crops altogether because that's what he has. So the number of corn acres plus the number of bean acres has to be equal to or less than or less than or equal to 200 because that's all the acreages that he has. So that being said, it's been graphed right here. Graph the solution of system of inequalities, okay? So we have our y is less than or equal to 80 is this line. Our y is greater than or equal to 20 is this line, right? So we're shading for the less than, we're shading for the greater than. This line here is my x has to be greater than or equal to 30. And so greater than tells me I'm shading that side. And then this line over here is my x plus y is less than or equal to 200. Okay, if we solve that for y, it would be y is equal to negative x, not equal to, sorry, less than or equal to negative x plus 200. Okay, well, the plus 200 is way over here on the graph that they're not even showing us, but they've got most of the line on here, okay? And because it's less than or equal to, we're walking downhill and we're shading this part here. So we end up shading this area. And remember, that's our feasible region. This is our feasible region. But what are our corners, right? What are our corner points? Well, here, here, here and here. But to get the actual values, we have to find out where they intersect. So we have to find the intersection here between um, x is greater than or equal to 30 and y is greater than or equal to 80. Well, they would meet at, well, let's turn the page because it's done on the next page. I like to look at this. I'm not sure if that, if this graph is still on the next page, but let's turn the page and look at the rest of this problem. And of course, my graph is not here, so I don't want to um, get confused. But basically, they've made my y is, what was it, greater than or equal to 20. They've just made an equals, right? So it crosses at 30 comma 20. These two cross at 30 comma 80. We've got these two crossing at 120 comma 80 and this one at 180 comma 20. You've got to find the points where those vertices um, meet up, right, where the vertices are created because the lines meet up, our corner points. And then we're going to substitute these coordinates, right, into our equations, into our objective function equation. So if we do 30 acres of corn and we add our 20 acres of beans, we get $20,450, right? What about 30 acres of corn and 80 acres of beans? Well, $37,250. What about 120 or 180 acres of corn and 20 acres of beans gives us $94,700. And here we have 120 acres of corn and 80 acres of beans for $81,880. So what is best? Well, it's this lineup right here. 180 acres of corn 20 acres of beans gives us $94,700 of, 
profit for his planting for that year. All right, so that is how that linear construction works. Now, I'm going to go through lesson three with you here in the video. I will not be able to go through it with you in, on, in the class because um, it's broken in here. So um, you could cross out this lesson three. I am going to go through it with you, but the what they've got here in the book, um, their math and whatever does not equal out. So I'm going to go through it with the proper corrected work here. So example three reads that Natasha enjoys cultivating peony and rose bush plants. She sells the peony bushes for $8 each. So peonies for $8 each and the rose bushes for $15 each. Each peony bush requires two square feet of garden space. So the peony bush requires two square feet. And the cost, or sorry, and costs an average of $4 to grow. Each rose bush requires five square feet and costs $2 to grow. So it says this year, Natasha can devote no more than 400 square feet of her garden space for her flowers. So she's got no more than 400 square feet. And she can spend no more than $300 to grow them. How many of each kind of flower should she grow to maximize her profits, right? So she's labeled her rose bushes X and her peonies with the Y, all right? So what is the objective function? Well, the objective function is that her profits are going to be the $15. Let me see if I can get this all on one page here. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> this is annoying. Okay, her profits are fifteen dollars per rose bush plus eight dollars. Oh, here those eight dollars for each peony. Okay, and so that is her profit breakdown. So what are the constraints? Right, that is our next step. Step write the inequalities which represent the constraints. So Natasha can use no more than 400 square feet for her flower beds. So five is how much the um, rose bushes require. So five times the number of rose bushes plus the two square feet times the number of peonies cannot be over. So it has to be less than or equal to 400. Okay. And the next restraint is the fact that she cannot spend more than $300. So our rose bushes cost her $2, so 2 times the number of rose bushes, plus $4 times the number of peonies has to be less than or equal to $300. And what are some of our other constraints? Well, she cannot grow negative, is this on the page, right? She can't grow negative number of rose bushes or negative number of peonies, okay? So those are our restraints. Now, here is where this comes apart from the book right here at section three, which is graph the solution, because this graph is not the, what we have here, okay? This graph is not correct. So I have done the work and let's take a look at that. So for our first constraint, right? 5X plus 2Y is less than or equal to 40. I solve for y. So y is less than or equal to negative 5 over 2x plus 200. And then I graphed that, okay? So plus 200 is way up here. Negative 5 over 2 tells me that I'm going downhill, right? Minus 5 over 2. Now, that's too hard to graph when my numbers are at 200, right? But I can figure out what my y-axis and my x-axis crossings are, right? Like we did several weeks ago, where I'm gonna set my y equal to zero, so then it becomes 5x is equal to 400, or x equals 80, so x is 80 when y is zero, 
And then in this one, I set my x equal to zero. So I ended up at 2y equals 400, or y is at 200. So it's at when x is zero, y is at 200, which we already knew because of this part, right? We knew that we were crossing our y-axis at 200, but I wanted to figure out my x-axis, so I found the xy intercepts. Okay, so those are the two xy intercepts. I could use those to draw my line, which is what I did, okay? Then for the other constraint, right, the amount of money she could spend, I found the xy intercepts for those. So here, when y equals zero, 2x is equal to 300, or x is at 150. So 150 comma zero, okay, which is way over here. And then I set my x equal to zero. So for y equals 300, y equals 75. So at zero comma 75 is where these lines crossed. So then, or where it crossed the y-axis. So then I could connect those two points and draw that line. Now I needed to remember my shading, right? In this case, my y was less than, so I was shading underneath. In this case, my y was less than, so I was also shading underneath. And then I needed to graph my x is greater than or equal to zero, y is greater than or equal to zero. Those are just the axes, right? But we're going to be shading up here and over here. So this was the final shading, my feasible area, right? all inside here, but then I needed to figure out what are my intersections, okay? Where, obviously I know what this intersection is and this one and this one, zero, zero, but what is this intersection? Well, it's where my two lines intersect each other. Now, to solve for the intersection of these two lines, rather than substituting in, what I noticed was that this 2y was close to being the same but not opposite of this 4y. So what I multiplied that first equation by a negative 2. And I changed them over to equal signs because when we're doing this type of work, um, the greater than or less than, or that they don't really function well. So by multiplying each term by 2, I got, ne or negative 2, sorry, I got negative 10x minus 4y minus 800, and then I added this equation, right? We did this last week, the elimination method. So 2x plus 4y equals 300. My negative 4y and positive 4y cancel, so I'm left with negative 8x equals negative 500. Solving for x, I see that x is 62.5. So I know that the x term here is 62.5. Now I need to figure out my y term. So I'm substituting this x back into this equation. So I have two times x or two times 62.5 plus four y equals 300. Two 62.5 is 125. I'm gonna subtract that from both sides. So I get four y equals negative 75, or not negative, equals 175. <laughs> Dividing by four, I get my y is equal to 43.75. So there is this point, okay? Because remember, I need the vertices. I need the corner points to figure out my best profit. I'm gonna slide my paper up here. And if you're following along with the book, you can see um, where the errors have come in, right? Their, their um, interceptions are not correct. This one is but that is not, and neither is this, okay? They, they graph the lines incorrectly. And so what happens when you graph lines incorrectly? You, your points are not going to work. So here are our points, and we're gonna put our points, right? And I didn't do um, the zero because I know planting nothing is not gonna be her best profit. So I'm not gonna waste my time figuring out what, how much money she's gonna make if she plants nothing. Guess what, she's gonna make nothing, okay? So the first point, zero comma 75. So she planted zero rose bushes and 75 peonies, okay? She made $600. Here she planted 80 rose bushes and zero peonies, and she made $1,200. And here, 
this 62.5 and 43.75, right? We can't do partial plants, so we had to round them down. She could plant 62 whole um, rose bushes and 60 or 43 whole peonies. So putting that in, we find our profit to be $1,274. So this is the most optimal planting that she should do. 62 rose bushes, 43 peonies. Okay. So that is example three. Um, like I said, the book, the setup is fine up until here. And then this part is all incorrect. Okay, <laughs> all right. So um, yeah, this is the right way to do number three. One more example they have here, number four. Let's take a look at that. For this example, number four is pretty quick because this is it. They want you to graph the feasible region for the given constraints and calculate the minimum value for the objective function. So they've given you the objective function. They want you to, um, here are the constraints. They want you to find the feasible region and the minimum, minimum value, okay? How small, the smallest it can be. So with our constraints listed here, they graphed their lines and the found the vertex points, although they didn't quite list this one out all the way, 0, 14 for 8, 8, 4, and 20, 0. Okay, now they want you to find the minimum. We've been finding the maximum, but putting these points in, what is the minimum, the least that we can, uh, I don't know, profit from I don't know what the story is but uh, let's see what is the least we can do well zero of the three dollars or three five times the 14 gives us 70 three times four and five times eight gives us 52 three times eight five times four is 44 and three times 20 five times zero is 60 so this is the optimal um, or sorry the minimal value for whatever is happening here, for whatever is being calculated, that is the most minimal. Most of these we've been talking about profits, so of course we want the maximum, but in this case they just wanted the minimum. Okay? All right, let's turn the page and do some problems now, actually work through a couple together. All right, we're in Algebra 2, Book 2, Lesson 13. We're on page 52, looking at problem number one. Now, this book seems to be like the opposite of a lot of textbooks where the example problems were super kind of hard and then the work problems are fairly straightforward. So here is, here is our objective function and here are our constraints. I am going to solve these two for their xy intercepts rather than solving them for the slope intercept form. So if I make x zero, then I have five y is equal to 35. That's just how we do these. So y is equal to seven, right? So when x is zero, y is seven. And then for substituting a zero in for y, I have two x is equal to 35. So x is equal to half of 35, which is 17.5. So when x is 17.5, y is zero. I'm kind of not leaving myself a lot of space, but that's okay. I'll make this work. All right, same thing for this one. I want to figure out the intercepts. So I'm going to make x equal to zero first. So I have 2y is equal to 35. Is that correct? Did I write them? Oh, yeah, that is correct. 2y is equal to 35, so y is equal to 17.5. So when x is 0, y is 17.5. And changing out my y for 0, I have 5x is equal to 35. So here my x is equal to 7. So when x is 7, y is 0. All right, those are my two points. These are the graph that I need to make. I'm going to go ahead and get my graph set up, and I'll be right back. 
All right, since I know that my X and my Y cannot be zero based on these two constraints, right? I just drew the first coordinate of, or the first quadrant of the coordinate plane. Um, oops. So now I need to plot my points, right? X has to be greater than or equal to zero. So I know that my shading is gonna go this way. Y has to be greater than or equal to zero. So I know I'm shading that direction, okay? It's our, it's our uh, axis, right? And then here for my first line, I'm going to be at zero comma seven, which is here, and 17.5, oh, I didn't give myself enough room, shoot, comma zero. All right, let me see, do I have enough space? 14, 16, oh, just barely. I forgot about that one. It goes off. This is 18, so this is 17. So 17.5 is approximately here. All right. So this is a solid line, and it goes a little something like this. Okay. It is this equation uh, here belongs to that line. And it is, your Y would be less than or equal to, so I'm shading underneath, okay? All right, this next one is at zero comma 17.5. That one I gave myself enough room for. And at seven comma zero, which is here. And again, we're gonna be less than, it's a solid line, and we're gonna be shading underneath. we're shading underneath. I might as well just mark it here. Okay. So I know that this is the area to be shaded. This is our feasible region, right? Right there, feasible region. So I need the corner points, which are all of these. Now, I feel like this is probably five comma five but I really should make sure, okay? It looks like it is, but, you know, I'm estimating my 17.5s, so uh, we should find the proper intersection of these two points. I am going to use the elimination method. So I will take this first equation and I'm going to multiply it by a negative five, and I'm gonna multiply this one by a two, positive two. So when I do that, I get 10x or negative 10x minus 25y is less, or as well, I can't do the lessons when I do it this way. So it's equal to five times 35, negative five times 35, or a negative 175. I said I can't do it that way. It has to be equal. Okay. Multiplying this one by 2, I get 10x plus 2y is 2 times 35 or 70. Okay. Now I'm going to add these two together. My x's cancel out and I have negative 25y plus 2y, which gives me a negative 23y, which is equal to negative 105, okay? So my y is gonna be equal to, before I can figure out what my y is equal to, I actually see that I made an error right here. So we always gotta check our work, right? This is not two y, because I was supposed to multiply it by two, and that would give me a four y. So negative 25 y plus four y is a negative 21 y, okay? Now I have to divide both sides by a negative 21, and that gives me a five. Now, I'm not gonna go any farther. It just confirms that this is the point five comma five, okay? That's enough. We just need a confirmation. If this is coming up as a, I don't even know, 4.5, then we would have to keep going, right? But that is the point five five. This is the point zero comma seven, 
and this is the point seven comma zero. Okay, and then of course, this is zero, zero, but what are they asking? They are asking for, oh, the minimum and the maximum value. So I'm assuming zero, zero is gonna get used this time. So let's do these, stick them into our um, original equation here, into our objective function. So might as well start with zero comma zero. And, and we are putting it into the profit is equal to three comma zero or three times zero, sorry, plus 12 times zero or a profit of zero. Okay, you're not making any money if you're not doing anything. If this is even profit, I guess, I don't know for sure. So the next point is zero comma seven. Okay, so our profit is what I'm calling it is three times zero plus 12 times 7. Well, this 3 times 0 is 0. 12 times 7 is 96. Okay? Shush. The next point is at 5, comma 5. So I have my profit is going to be equal to 3 times 5 plus 12 times 5. Well, 3 times 5 is 15. 12 times 5 is 60. So 75. And then I have the point seven comma zero. So my profit is gonna equal three times seven plus 12 times zero or 21. So the minimum is at zero, zero, shocker. Our maximum is gonna be at zero comma seven because that's 96, okay? So the limited information that we were given for this problem we found the minimum and the maximum with the constraints and what was given to us, okay? That's problem number one. Let's take a look at problem number two. All right, for problem number two, I'm gonna need the book and the scratch paper because there we're talking about Anthony and he's growing barley and soybeans under the following limits. He can spend no more than $3,000 $3, for seed and no more than $4,000 for fertilizer. Barley seeds cost $15 per acre and $50 per acre to fertilize. Soybean costs $50 per acre and $25 per acre to fertilize. And it tells us to use this chart for average yields and selling price per bushel to write an objective function and determine a maximum profits for the constraints. All right, so the first thing we want to do is find our objective function, right? And so I'm going to set it up like this. So let's say that X is gonna equal our barley and Y is going to equal our soybeans, okay? And then we're gonna use this to set up our objective function. I don't like that they keep labeling it P, so I'm labeling it OF, objective function. To me, that makes more sense. And it helps me to remember what that word actually is, <laughs> okay? So objective function is going to equal the amount of barley times the cost of the barley. So for every 62 bushels, you get $4.75 per bushel, right? And here we have 47 bushels is what the yields are. And that is $9.50 per bushel. But since here we're talking about acres, we have to kind of change this over because it's 62 bushels per acre, but they're not giving us the acreage price. So for our objective function, starting with our barley, it's 62 bushels, which is one acre's worth, but at $4.75 per bushel. So by multiplying these together, we will get our price per acre, all right? Plus the same thing for the soybeans. So it's 47 times $9.50 times a number of our beans, right? So that's our objective function. So let's do the math and get this simplified equation here. All right, so we've got our objective function being $294.50 times the number amount of barley plus $446.50 times the amount of soybeans, all right? Now, what are our constraints? That is this part here. 
he can't spend more than $3,000 for seed or more than $4,000 for fertilizer. So what are these fertilizer slash seed costs? Well, I know that the barley seeds cost $15. So 15 times X plus the $50 cost of seed for the beans, so 50Y, has to be less than or equal to 3,000, right? I also know that for the fertilizer, that $50 worth of barley fertilizer plus $25 of soybean fertilizer has to be less than or equal to 4,000. And then I also know, right, that we are not planning negatives. So my X has to be greater than or equal to zero and my Y has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? not planting negative amounts of seed. So let's figure out before we start our graph, what our um, axis points are, where are we crossing our intercepting our axes here. So for this one, um, if I make my y zero, then I have 15x is equal to 3000. So x is going to be equal to 200. Now if I make my um, x 0, then I have 50y is equal to 3000. So my y is equal to 60. So I have the point 200 comma 0 and 0 comma 60. All right, I'm trying to leave myself space over here. For this one, if I make my y equal to zero, then I have 50x is equal to 4,000. So my x is going to be equal to 80. Okay? Or, yeah, 80. So 80 comma zero is that point. And then if I make my y, or my x equal to zero, then I have 25y is equal to 4,000. So my y is equal to... 160. So this is the point 0 comma 160. All right, so there are the intercepts for those lines. Here is this line. I will figure out where I can put my graph in best and then I will be right back. All right, since these were multiple of 20, I decided to make my grid marks 20 points each. And so that is the chart that I've set up. I know my x and my y have to be greater than zero, so I did not need the rest of the coordinate plane. Quadrant one was enough, okay? So plotting this first line, 15x plus 50y is less than or equal to 3,000, okay? My x-intercept is at 200 comma zero, which is here. My y-intercept is at zero comma 60, which is here, okay? This is a solid line, and I'll be shading underneath. So this looks like this, and this is this line. Please make sure you're marking your lines so that when I check your work, I know what I'm looking at, okay? For this next one, its intercepts are at 80 comma 0, which is here and at 0, 160, which is here. Again, a solid line, and again, I'm shading underneath. Okay, so it looks like this. Shading underneath, and that is this line. Okay, so my feasible region is here. And I need to find my corners, right? Well, this corner is at 0, 60. This corner is at 80, 0. But what is this corner here? To me, it looks like 60, 40, right? But we need to double check. That's what it looks like. But our graphs aren't always enough to just assume that. So looking at these two equations, if I multiply this equation by a negative 2, then I will have be able to cancel out my y's. So 
I'm going to multiply this by a negative 2. I get negative, and this is not a negative sign. I was just, there, that's better. I get negative 100x minus 50y is equal to, for this case, negative 8,000. And then I'm going to add the other equation. So 15x plus 50y is equal to 3,000. And I end up with negative 85x, the y's cancel, is equal to negative 5,000. So when we divide by negative 85, we see that x is equal to 58.8. Now, I can check my work, but I've already done that, so I know that this is correct. Okay, so my x value is at 58.82. So what is my y value? Well, I'm going to take this x value and I'm going to substitute it back into this equation that I didn't change before. So I have 15 times 58.82 plus 50y is equal to 3,000, right? That's where I'm at. So 15 times 58.82 is 882.3 plus 50y, which is equal to 3,000, right? I'm going to subtract this 800 from both sides and I get that 50y is equal to 2,100, 17.7. Now, I know this isn't going to work out evenly, but that's all right. y is equal to, we divide both sides by 50, so y is equal to 42.354, okay? 42.354 for precision's sake. Now, I rounded here, so it's not that precise, but whatever. Here we go. So, our objective function now, we need to figure out what we're dealing with. They asked us for, what did they ask us for? Determine the maximum. We want to know, what is his name? Anthony. Anthony wants to know how much money he can make. The most. He wants the most, which makes sense, right? So I'm not going to use zero, zero because that seems like a waste of my time. But at zero comma 60, our objective function... It tells me that $294.50 times zero plus $446.50 times 60 will yield how much? Well, it's going to yield $2,690. Okay, that's that one. For the next problem, or next point, remember, we can't have partial acreage here, so we need to um, scale it back. This is going to be 58, 42. All right, so our objective function tells me that I've got 294.50 times 58 plus 446.50 times... 42. And what does that give us? Well, 294.5 times 58 is 17081. Plus 446.5 times 42 is 18753 for a total of $35,834. All right, last point. 80 comma 0. So our objective function is going to be 294.50 times 80 plus 446.50 times 0. Or just this part, right? Which gives us a total of $23,560. Now, Andrew wants to make the most for his money which is this $35,843, which means he should plant 58 acres of barley and so 58 acres of barley 
and this is how you should be writing it when you're done. You don't need a whole sentence. Um, 42 acres of soy. Okay? That's our final answer. All right, so these problems are a bit time consuming, but they're not anything uh, um, so horribly hard that they can't be solved, all right? We're setting up our system of inequalities. We're finding our favorable region. We're finding our corner points, right? These are our corner points for our maximum and minimums are at the vertices or basically the corners, okay? Solving for some of these corner points is a little time consuming, but again, work we know how to do. And then we are inputting them each into our objective function formula to figure out our maximums and minimums, right? In most of the cases, they're talking about moolah, and so you want the most, you wanna make the most money. But some cases, maybe they're talking about spending, right? And they want to spend the least amount as possible or whatever. Setting up the um, constraints shouldn't be too bad. If you have an issue with the constraints, please let me know so I can help you through it. Okay, this section is kind of a chonker, just time-wise. Um, I know in class I'm not going to be able to cover as much as I'd like to, but here are the problems, okay? So go ahead and finish the rest of I don't even know, lesson 13, is that what we're doing? Um, and meet me back here for lesson 14. Lesson 14 begins on page 54, and it is completing the square. And it tells us here that not all quadratic equations have perfect roots. Quadratics that do not have perfect roots cannot be factored. So the way we were solving them before, right, we were factoring, or we were taking the square root of both sides. But in these cases, that's not gonna be possible. It's just not factorable to do these problems, right? One times six is six, obviously. What are the factors of six? One and six, neither one of those are gonna give us eight, right? Two and three, neither one of those are gonna give us eight. So it's just not factorable. So what we need to do then in these cases is complete the square. And so we're gonna go through the steps of completing the square. The first step that we want to take when we have a coefficient of 1 on our quadratic term is we're going to move our constant to the opposite side of the equal sign. We just want to get it out of our way because it's not the constant we need, right? This constant is not allowing us to solve this quadratic equation. So we're going to move it to the other side. So because it's positive here, we're going to subtract it from both sides and we end up now with x squared minus 8x equals negative 6. Now the next step is we take our linear coefficient, the linear being just the variable that to the one power, we're going to take our linear coefficient and we're going to divide it by two or basically multiply it by one half. So eight times one half, okay, equals four, right? Here's how I like to do it. I'm going to put that four in a box and then I'm going to take that four and square it. And that four squared is 16. Okay, we want to keep this in a box. It'll help us when we get further along it to spot this. Now, my four squared is 16. So what I'm going to do is add 16 to both sides. Because I'm adding 16 to both sides, and if we were to reduce, they would just cancel each other out. We're not actually changing the equation, but you've got to add it to both sides. Okay, now what we have on the left-hand side of the equal sign is a perfect square binomial, all right? So when we go to write this perfect square binomial, we're gonna have x, this is the sign that's gonna carry down, whatever the sign was here, minus, and the four is what we put in the box. So what we put in the box goes here, the quantity squared. And then we just add these terms, negative six plus 16 is 10. And now that we have this perfect square binomial, we can solve it just like we were before, right? To the opposite of squaring something is to take the square root. So they took the square root of both sides, right? And they ended up with x minus 4 equals plus or minus the square root of 10. They have added 4 to both sides. So x equals 4 plus or minus the square root of 10. Those are, that's our two answers for that equation, all right? So looking at the next one. 
x squared minus 2x plus 7 equals 0. We have a coefficient of 1, so the first thing we're going to do is move that constant out of the way. It is not the constant that we want. It's a positive 7, so we're going to do the opposite and subtract. Then we're going to take this 2. 2 times 1 half equals 1. There's my box. 1 squared is equal to 1. So we're going to add 1 to both sides. Now on this side of the equation, the left side, I have a perfect square binomial. This negative sign is going to drop down. So x minus what's in my box, which is a 1, the quantity squared, is equal to negative 7 plus 6, which is negative 6. I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Okay, now here they threw in the imaginary number system, right? So I have x minus 1 is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 6. Okay, x minus 1 is equal to plus or minus i times the square root of 6. Now moving up to the top of page 55, we have that we're going to add 1 to both sides. So x equals 1 plus or minus i times the square root of 6. And that is our answer for that one, right? Now, example number 3 is a little bit different because we don't have a coefficient of 1 for our quadratic term. So what we have to do first is we have to divide each term by whatever that coefficient is, in this case, 3. When we divide each term by 3, we end up with x squared minus 2 over 3x minus 2 equals 0. Okay. Now, now we are at a coefficient of 1 and we just do what we we're supposed to do. We need to get rid of this. We need to move it over, right? So it's a, po a negative 2, so we're going to add 2 to both sides. Now, here's the part that I like, the reason that I like to use the box. We have 2 over 3 times 1 half, right? Which is just 1 third. That goes in my box. Then I take 1 third and I square it. Well, 1 third squared is 1 ninth, okay? So I'm adding 1 ninth to both sides. Now I have my perfect square binomial. It's going to be have a negative sign, and it's x minus 1 third, the quantity squared, equals, now this is a reminder in adding and subtracting fractions, right? They have to have the same uh, denominator. So to give this 2 a denominator of 9, we have to multiply it by 9, right? So 18 over 9 plus 1 over 9 is 19 over 9. We take the square root of both sides and we get x minus 1 third equals plus or minus the square root of 19 over 3, right? They took the square root of 9 and the square root of 19 separate. The square root of 9 is 3. But they forgot the plus and minus, at least in this step. Now, we need to get x by itself, so we're going to add 1 third to both sides. If you left your answer like this, I would be fine with that. If you wrote it like this, x is equal to 1 plus or minus the square root of 19 over 3, that's fine too. If you want to write it like this, that is fine as well. All right? Any one of these is correct. I, you, don't, you know, we don't have to split hairs, right? So that was our answer for example three. So they've got here at the bottom ish of page 55 they have these steps for you to go through but let's take a look at some of these problems together so we're in algebra 2 book 2 lesson 14 page 55 problem number one um, they just want us to solve these equations by completing the square x squared minus 8x minus 9 equals 0 we have a coefficient of 1 so our first task is to move this 9 so we're going to add the 9 to both sides so we end up with x squared minus 8x, I like to leave a space, equals 9. Okay, so that's what how I'm going to write this. Now, I take my linear term, which is 8, and I multiply it by 1 half, which gives me a 4. I'm putting that in the box, and then I'm taking my 4 and I'm squaring it to get a 16. I'm going to now add 16 to both sides. Okay, this is now my perfect square binomial. And it's going to be x minus what's in the box, which is a 4, the quantity squared. And that's going to be equal to 9 plus 16, or 25. Okay? 
I'm going to take the square root of both sides because I'm trying to get this x by itself. The opposite of squaring is the square root. So I'm left with x minus 4 is equal to the plus or minus the square root of 25, which is 5. Now to get x further by itself, I'm going to add 4 to both sides. So I have that x is equal to, I'm going to break it into two pieces, a positive 5 plus 4, and x is equal to a negative 5 plus 4. Okay, that's what I have here, plus 5 plus 4, negative 5 plus 4. So here x is equal to 9, and over here x is equal to negative 1. And those are my two answers. Okay, for number 2 x squared minus 8x plus 13 equals 0. Po or coefficient of 1, so my first step is to subtract this 13 from both sides, and I get x squared minus 8x is equal to negative 13. Now, this is basically the same setup as over here, right? So I know that 8 times 1 half is equal to 4, putting it in a box, 4 squared is equal to 16, so I'm going to add 16 to both sides. This is my perfect square binomial of x minus what's in the box, which is 4, the quantity squared, is going to be equal to negative 13 plus 16, or 3. Okay? So when we take the square root of both sides, we're left with x minus 4 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 3. To get x by itself, we're going to add 4 to both sides, so we get x is equal to 4 plus or minus the square root of 3. And those are two answers, okay? Looking at number 3, we have x squared plus 2x minus 4 equals 0. We have a coefficient of 1, so we're going to move that 4 over, adding it to both sides. And we end up with x squared plus 2x equals 4. I'm going to take 2 and multiply it by 1 half, which is 1, putting that in a box. And then I'm going to take 1 squared, which again is 1, and we're going to add 1 to both sides. Okay? Now this is our perfect square binomial. It is an x. This time it's a plus what's in the box, which is a 1, the quantity squared, is equal to 5. We're going to take the square root of both sides. So x plus 1 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 5. To get x by itself, we're going to subtract 1 from both sides, so we get that x is equal to negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 5. Okay? Let's take a look at the next three problems. Number 4 is x squared minus x minus 2 equals 0. Coefficient of 1, so we're going to move that 2 by adding 2 to both sides to start off. So we get x squared minus x equals 2. Now the coefficient here is 1. 1 times a half is, e is equal to 1 half. I'm putting that in a box. 1 half, the quantity squared, is equal to 1 fourth. So that is what we're adding to both sides. Okay, This is a perfect square binomial, and it is going to be x minus what's in the box, or 1 half, the quantity squared. And it's going to be equal to 2 plus 1 fourth. Now, to make this, basically it's a 2 over 1, right? We have to multiply everything by 4. So we have 8 over 4 plus 1 over 4, so 9 over 4. We're going to take the square root of both sides. So we have x minus 1 half is equal to, now both 9 and 4 are perfect squares, so we can take the square root. It's going to be plus or minus 3 over 2. To solve this, I need to add 1 half to both sides, and I get that x is equal to, I'm going to break it into two parts, a positive 3 over 2 minus, or plus 1 half, sorry, and x is equal to a negative 3 over 2 plus 1 half. So here, x is going to equal be equal to 4 halves, or 2, and here, x is going to be equal to negative 2 over 2, or a negative 1. So we went to a fraction, but we came back to whole numbers. Isn't that nice? All right, number 5. 2x squared plus 
plus x minus 3 equals 0. Now, we don't have a coefficient of 1, so here our first step is to divide each term by the coefficient of the quadratic equation, or the quadratic number, which is this 2. So we end up with x squared plus 1 half x, and it's negative 3 over 2 that I'm going to add to both sides, so I'm going to put it over here, 3 over 2, okay? Now, I have 1 half times 1 half, which is equal to 1 fourth, putting that in a box, and 1 fourth, the quantity squared, is equal to 1 sixteenth, and that is what I'm adding to both sides, okay? This is my perfect square binomial, x plus what's in the box, 1 fourth, the quantity squared, is going to be equal to 3 halves plus 1 16th. Now, to make it a 16th, I have to, of course, multiply this by 8, so I get 24 sixteenths plus 1 16th, or 25 sixteenths. I think it's kind of nice that they keep giving you these perfect roots, right? These 25 is a perfect square, 16 is a perfect square. So when we take the square root of both sides, we get x plus 1 over 4 is equal to 5, plus or minus, 5 over 4, right? The square root of 25 is 5, the square root of 16 is 4. So plus or minus 5 over 4. I'm subtracting 1 fourth from both sides. So that x, I'm going to break it into two parts, right? is positive 5 over 4 minus 1 over 4, and x is equal to a negative 5 over 4 minus 1 over 4. Those are my two parts. Here, x is equal to 4 over 4, or 1, and here x is going to be equal to a negative 6 over 4, or a negative 2, or sorry, 3 halves. I set it upside down. 3 over 2, because we want to reduce our fractions. All right, last one, number 6. x squared minus 10x plus 30 equals 0, coefficient of 1, so I'm going to subtract 30 from both sides as my first step. To get x squared minus 10x equals negative 30. 10 times 1 half equals 5, I'm putting that in a box. 5 squared equals 25. So I'm going to add 25 to both sides. This is my perfect square binomial of x minus what's in the box, which is 5, the quantity squared, which is going to be equal to a negative 5. We're going to take the square root of both sides. So x minus 5 is going to be equal to negative the square root of negative 5, which we know we cannot do, so it's going to be the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 5, or i times the square root of 5, plus or minus. I'm going to add 5 to both sides, so that my x is equal to 5, plus or minus i times the square root of 5. Okay? Now, Completing the square in and of itself is not that challenging. We have a coefficient of 1 where the constant is not the right one that we need. So we're going to kick it over to the other side, right? Then we need to fill that in with the constant that we do need. To find that, we take our linear coefficient, multiply it by 1 half, and then take that number and square it. I put this one in a box at this point because that's what's going to go into our perfect square binomial parentheses, right? We square it, and then we add the square to both sides. Then we have our perfect square binomial using the number from the box, and then we just add up whatever constant part was left over, okay? Taking the square root of both sides and solving for x, all right? That's completing the square, lesson 14. Go ahead and finish um, the rest of lesson 14, and we'll take a look at lesson 15. Lesson 15 starts on page 57, and it's just the review page. Now, um, for review, this is for extra credit. If you choose to complete Lesson 15, photocopy it and turn it in to me with your scratch paper if necessary. All of your scratch paper should be turned in to me for your quizzes and whatnot. 
but lesson 15 is for extra credit. So if I grade it and you've gotten an A worth of points, then you get 10 extra points of extra credit. Bs are seven, Cs are five points. Anything less than that does not get extra credit points. But if you choose to do this, please photocopy um, your pages with your answers and make sure you put your name on it. If you have any questions um, or problems with any of the work along the way, please do not hesitate to contact me. Otherwise, until next time.